he ended up in Singapore exactly as the surrender took place. And there began the three and a half years of hell that Len then went through along with many of his comrades that cost so many lives. And whilst I'm starting to fill up here, it's with absolute humility and a great sense of privilege and an even greater sense of honour that I ask you ladies and gentlemen to welcome this extraordinary man tonight, Mr Len Gibson. And I'm pleased to be able to say ladies. The last time I was one of these meetings, they were all gentlemen. Now, apart from Carol there, I want one of the ladies to tell me what this is. Can you all hear me, by the way? Yes. Yes, I hate microphones. <laughs> now then, ladies, what is it? Line club. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody was near there. Carol, tell them what it is. No, She's I've forgotten. I've forgotten. Well, it's, it's called a job happy. That's it. <laughs> After working for a year and a half on the railway, everything that I wore, with the sweat and it's worn out. So I went to the Japs and asked them for some trousers, some pants, some shirt. No, the only thing they gave me was this. Well, <laughs> It became very precious to me because I wore this for two years. I worked in it, I slept in it, I went swimming in it. It was one of the precious things that I had for those two years. I nearly lost it once. I was working in the jungle on the Mowbray Road and there was a little river there every night after working, we used to go down, wash our job happy, have a bath before going to sleep. I found a nice little spot on this river. It was, it was a jungle river, not very wide, it was only that deep. But it was lovely to walk on because there were lovely flat stones, no soil, no moss, no grass. And I found a spot down the river where I could go every night on my own. And I considered that little bit of the jungle as my bit. And one night I went down, washed my job happy, hung up to dry. I thought to myself, I would love to be able to swim. But this river is not for swimming. I wonder what it's like further down. So I wandered about a quarter of a mile down into the jungle, down this river. And I found a pool. Lovely. A pool about six it's six yards wide. I sat on the edge, put my legs down, lowered myself in, and as I was getting down to a sitting position, something brushed against my side here. And there was a lovely black snake. <laughs> and I was fascinated by the lovely curls it made as it swam away. Well, sat back and enjoyed my water. And then suddenly, Heard voices, children's voices, miles into the jungle, miles away from habitation. How could children get there? So, in my birthday suit, I walked back up the river and saw two ladies doing their washing and half a dozen children splashing about <coughs> in the water. I had to get my job happy. I had to get past them, so I did a full Monty. <laughs> now, I got a surprise seeing them there, but they got a big response in there. <laughs> the children ran to their mothers, everything went quiet, and I walked past, picked up my job happy. How did I come to be in such a predicament? Well, I'll start from the beginning. Let's start at the very beginning. 
I sure you can hear me at the back. There was a noise, that's all right. 1939, I was busy. Worked in the factory, as Alan says, from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5, Mondays to Fridays. Saturday, we worked on Saturdays, 8 to 12.30. Monday night, I had three hours science lesson. Tuesday night, two hours French lesson. Wednesday night, two hours English lesson. Friday night, two hours French lesson. You're all saying, what on earth did you do on Thursday night? <laughs> well, I was in the terrier, so I went to Livingston Road Drill Hall and I did my drills. I became a signaller. And at one time, I was called out the parade and told that I was going to Catrick. Well, it was January and February. If you'd been to Catrick in those days in January, you'd have thought you were in Siberia. <laughs> Anyhow, I found my way to Catrick. I was going into a lecture for the first time and I wasn't sure of whether to go in or not. The officers were standing there. I thought I'd come to the wrong place. And then some sergeants turned up. Found out I was, I, do you know what? I had one stripe on the arm. And I was the only one. The officers went to the officers' mess, the sergeants went to the sergeants' mess, and I was in a mess all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> However, <coughs> the chemist and the officer said, and where are you from? And what's your well, I said, I'm from Sunderland and 125 Regiment. Oh, never heard of it, never heard of it. So anyhow, about five weeks later when the course was finished, I was called up to the uh, Basher Martin's office. And he looked at the papers and he said, you've done very well there. He said, I should make you a sergeant, but I've got too many bloody sergeants on <laughs> So I stayed as a bombardier. A letter arrived from, from Catrick, and in big letters right along the top it said, Well done, youngster. I was the youngest one on the court, I was the lowest one in rank, and I'd come out top. Well done, Sunders 125. <laughs> Sadly, I became redundant because the regiment was changed from a field regiment to an anti tank regiment. In a field regiment, you didn't need surveyors, you didn't need signalers. So I was, well, I wasn't out to work, but uh, <laughs> you didn't need the signalers anymore. We moved down to uh, Norfolk. And there joined the 18th Division as an anti tank regiment, which I didn't like. From there, I was in the advance party going up to Scotland for exercises and manoeuvres. Couldn't get a drink of water, everything was frozen. From there, we moved across to the Clyde where we boarded a ship called the Strathaird. I was put in charge of the brain gunners. And out at sea, Freezing rain, the brain gunners were in boxes, just big enough for two men in a brain gun, and I had to take hot cocoa around to them. It was a job to get me around the, the, the ship. When you got to the box, there were just two helmets shown, so you tapped them on the head and you said, Cocoa time! Oh, the got up. We were only there ten days because in the storm and the fog, we collided with this, uh, the Stirling Castle, another liner. Went back to uh, the Clyde and our battery went into uh, Glasgow where we did fire watching. We must have been good at the fire watching because they sent us down and we did fire watching in Lund Liverpool. And it was while at Liverpool I saw a notice saying 
Your country needs you. Young men needed to be trained as pilots. So they're, they're, that's for me. I'm a redundant signaler, so I'm going to try that out. I wrote to the ministry and I got travel warrant to go down to Cardington, where for three days they examined me physically and mentally and then gave me a sheet of paper saying I passed fit to be trained as a pilot for a two-seater night fighter. When I went back to my regiment, they had missed me. <laughs> <laughs> You're all getting ready to go abroad. Where are you going? Africa, they said. Oh, great. We went down to Wavenmouth, got into a liner called the Avance. We had a terrible journey up the Irish Sea, joined the convoy, <coughs> just set out for Africa. Well, you know, if you look at the map, if you're in the British Isles and you want to go to Africa, you go down. We didn't. We went that way. <laughs> I said to the lads, we're not going to Africa, we're going to Iceland. <laughs> Halfway across the Atlantic, our convoy changed. Our, our <coughs> destroyers left us. And what a sight. The Americans sent across cruisers, destroyers, planes and everything to meet us. <coughs> it did it about turn and they escorted us to uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. We went down the gangplank off the quayside, we walked along the quay, up another gangplank and found ourselves on an American ship called the Dickman, the Joseph T. Dickman. America wasn't in the war, about half the fleet looking after us, and we were on five of their troop ships. We ended up in um, Trinidad for a while, while they were refueled. A few days later we had to cross the line and it cost uh, two days to make the polywogs into shellbacks, the ancient order of shellbacks. It was great fun, but all that fun changed a few days later when we heard about Pearl Harbor. I felt sorry for the American crew. We called in at Cape Town for four days. The American escort left us and one British ship, the Dorset ship, took us across the Indian Ocean. The Americans gave us a lovely Christmas dinner in the middle of the ocean. We landed in uh, Bombay about New Year time, New Year's Eve. <coughs> Do you know, we, we thought we were going to a dance. Walked up the keys, I heard the music, dashed up. When we got there, it was Greens that called the police. There were some steps down to the dance floor. And when we looked down to the dance floor, it was crowded. <coughs> and not one woman in the place. <laughs> <coughs> The American sailors had our plane carriers on and, and our soldiers had US hats on and the poor band was having to play the Lambeth Walk over and over again <laughs> while our lads taught them how to dance. <laughs> After a fortnight doing exercises in Hamed Nagar, we went back to Bombay and that's when Alan says, we had to board this ship called the Observation, a dirty ship in many ways. And uh, I'd never like to sleep on below decks. I always slept on, on deck, especially if the weather was good. And one morning I was awakened by a voice. And when I looked over the side, there was a, a, a British <coughs> destroyer and the Man was shouting through the megaphone, get a move on Asia or we will have to leave you. Well, we couldn't go any faster. But... <laughs> <laughs> and then about a few days later, I loved to be in the ship on right on the bow. And one day 
I'm just standing there. Glorious day, sunshine on one side with land, beautiful beaches with palm trees. On that side is land, beautiful beaches with palm trees, sun shining on this. I looked the other side, I could see the bed of the ocean below me. It was a marvellous day. And I was thinking to myself, I love geography at school and all those things, I've, places I dreamt about here in the world. And then 27 Japanese planes came over. And from my position in the ship, I watched the great spouts of water come on starboard side, port side. Great spouts of water over here. Thuds. And I watched every bomb come down. Close to the ship, but not one. They did, did some damage, but not one direct hit. But the Japs knew where we were now. And on the next day, the 5th of February, the planes came over and attacked our, our ship for about two hours. And after a while, some of their bombs went through our officers' mess down into the engine room and that did the damage. I was up on the bow, they changed their tactics, they'd seen our ship, they went after the Felix Roussel. Now the Felix Roussel had uh, Northumberland Fusiliers on board and they were a machine gun regiment and it was fascinating to watch all the tracer bullets coming from their guns and the bombs coming down and they, in, in the end they did set fire to the Phoenix Roussel but do you know what another ship another plane came over dropped a bomb in the water tank and put the fire out <laughs> <laughs> Now we had near to us a little <coughs> ship called the Exeter. It was one of the three ships at the Battle of the River Plate. And the Japs turned their attention on the Exeter. I was fascinated to watch the Exeter. It was like a greyhound going through the water. <coughs> and it would do a quick turn to the port. And Mr. Bomb there. Quick turn to the star and miss that bomb there. Their bombs were falling, giving spouts of missing the, the exeter. They never ever got it there, but days later they sank the exeter further off down in Java. Now, by this time, smoke on the, and flames on the ship, we'd all gathered in the bow of the ship. The colonel stood on a bollard and uh, he had a short talk with the captain. Captain Smith, and he said, now, we're going to abandon ship. In the distance there, there's a pall of black smoke. He said, it's probably about eight miles or more. I want you to swim in that direction. Swim? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been out in my depths at the baths. <laughs> Well, I slid down the rope so far and I dropped the rest. But I tell you what, when I hit that water, was I pleased? The water was warm. <laughs> I'd never learned to swim because I couldn't stand cold water. <laughs> well, I got into the sea and I'm thinking to myself, a frog does that, so I'll do that. I tossed everything, sockets and everything that might impede me. And I thought to myself, you know, that black smoke. Will I be able to see it at night time? <laughs> and then I thought, I wonder how far how far I could swim in a day. If I could swim a mile a day, I would get there in oh <laughs> <laughs> good while after I sighted a boat in the distance. And I renewed my efforts. Not to do much. <laughs> and, uh, as I got near to it, I, my heart was in the way. In case it went away and left me. Kept on, kept on. And then I noticed some more people doing the same thing. We were picked up by this little Australian <coughs> boat and taken to Singapore. Do you know, it took us ages to get to Singapore. If I'd had to swim, I would have still been on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Singapore, I landed there in my shirt tears. And um, we were given one shirt, one pants, one socks, one handkerchief, all good green colour. All the regiment were given an old rifle and sent to work as infantry on the front line, except our troop. Our regiment should have had 48 anti-tank guns. Do you know where they were? <coughs> In Java. They put them on the wrong boat. <laughs> there were only four guns available in Singapore, and my little troop got them. We had two guns on one side of Booker T, but there were two guns on the other, they, in case the Japs came down the causeway. We were bombed, we were shelled, we were mortared, we were sniped at, but we never saw one of their Jap <coughs> tanks come down the road. And after about 10 days, one of our officers was killed by a sniper. A few were injured. After 10 days, everything stopped. We said, what's happening? <laughs> I went up to a brigadier and I said, what's going on, sir? He said, frankly, my son, I don't really know. <laughs> he didn't know what was going on. And then, up, up the team the road, came private cars with the Japanese flag flying. We are now capitulated and the Japs ordered all of us to go to a place called Changi. In Changi there was a prison. Well, we had to walk there. Depending where you were in Singapore, you might have had to walk 8 miles or 20 miles. But when we got to Changi, where were we going to sleep? We went to the barracks, we got kicked out because they wanted it for the hospital, <coughs> sick and injured. So we went on the veranda, the more injured and came in. So we ended up <coughs> sleeping on the beach under the palm trees. <coughs> Sounds lovely, doesn't it? With the bloody red ants, so terrible. <laughs> From there, we were divided into groups. And we went into Singapore and worked cleaning up Singapore. Now, as Alan said, I was from a, a banjo family. That banjo had been with me. I took it all over in the army with me. And I was missing it. So I wondered how could I make something like that. I wanted a box and I wanted some strings. Strings were easy to get. The Japanese had telephone wire. <laughs> I made a, an instrument. And then somebody said, can you not make a guitar? So I made a guitar. Now, I didn't know how to tune the guitar. And we were working on a hillside digging out the shelf to make a roadway and now we were digging away with these chunkers as they call them and I said to the fellow next to me, do you know how to tune a guitar? <laughs> well, he didn't. Then I, when the Jap was looking I moved in I said, do you know how to tune a guitar? <laughs> I got to the Australians and they said, you don't have a screw. <laughs> Then I found a, a, a fellow out in the Leicestershire Regiment, a regular, and he was married to a Chinese girl. And she was a guitar player, and he used to tune her guitar. Now, I'll tell you how to tune a guitar. Elephants and donkeys grow big ears. <laughs> e A D G B E. Isn't it easy? Oh, yeah. So you can cross your things to get that. Right, now then, he said, man, you know major chords, so, do you know what a major chord is? Do you know what a major chord is? And if you know what a major chord is? I found a lad from Newcastle, he says, my mate will know. He says, he's an organist from Taunton in Devon. I said, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> so he said, well, it's easy. It's do, me, so do. 
when I was in that church choir, we never start singing unless we went, do me so, do so me do, do me so, do so me do, do me so, do so. I'd, I'd sound thousands of do major chords. So he said, man, you need a minor chord. <laughs> do you know what a minor chord is? Well, it's easy, you just flatten the main. You see, so I went and I flattened all my knees. By that time, where's Carol? She's gone. She'll be back in no, a second. Carol's son, Red Conroon, and I, and Charlie Carney. Charlie was always laughing, so we called him Chuckles. <laughs> now, those two and me, we used to get together, sing songs, gather lads round, and uh, try to amuse the rest of the camp. We decided we would put on a show and uh, I changed I changed the words of a song in 1939 on a Saturday night on the BBC. It used to be we three. So I changed the words, used the tune. And we ended up this concert. Michael, Michael was on the stage with me with Charles Chuckles Carney and we sang. We three, we're not apart. We're a perfect harmony. Joe Stalin, he was on our side then. <laughs> Churchill and me. <laughs> we three, we do it well, we would, you know. In the air, on land and sea. Draw Stalin, Winston Churchill, and me. <laughs> we, we'll, I'm not in tune with this, you know. <laughs> we'll beat the Bosch army and drive Hitler barley, just wait and see. <coughs> And in the Pacific there'll be losses terrific of that mythical chap navy you'll see. We three, we set you free. Soon at home you all will be with Joe Stalin and who else? Winston Churchill and me. <laughs> I'm not finished. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had to say, me, who's me? It's Franklin D. Who's <laughs> ever? How long we were with that song. Little did we know, because we were singing that, soon at home we all will be. We had more than three years still to go. The food was terrible. The job gods were even worse. As we went round Singapore, we could see heads on railings. Poor Chinese that did, did, uh, got into <coughs> trouble with the jobs. So, so poor with conditions that um, and, and morale was low. And then, the Japs came and said, we're going to move. We're going to move to a pleasant, better place. There'll be a nice hospital. be very good food. All men go. Took us down to the station and they packed us with about 42 a, a cattle truck. They didn't let us out. We're there five days, five nights. Only once did we get out to have a drink of water. The poor men who had dysentery, they had a terrible life. And when we got to the place where there were going to be a lovely hospital and nice food, there was a place called Ban Pong. There wasn't even a drink of water. There was one Thai lady. She deserved a medal. She had one of those shadows well, they drop a bucket into the well and pull it up. And she worked all day giving our lads drink the water. 
Now, where was it? Where was the infirmary? There were some huts and there was even pools of water inside the huts. The bamboo huts were falling to pieces. For breakfast they gave us one cup of rice, one cup of tea and one cup of jippo. Now you all know what jippo is, don't you? Well, it's boiled water to its ingredients are added. And there was some funny grins that went through the old jippo. Right. Then we started to move. We had to walk right across the paddy fields and to reach the hills which were covered with jungle. Mm -hmm. Wherever we got at night time, we just lay in the jungle and slept. No, oh, sorry. In the morning, cup of tea, cup of rice, cup of jibbo, then walk. Walk all day, those that were tired got left behind. Those that had some of their possessions, they were throwing them away. It was a terrible journey through the jungle. And they would often say to me, are you still carrying that guitar? How can you still carry that Well, we finally reached a place called Tarso. And Carol's son, Michael, and Charlie Carney, Chuckles, and me, were given a job. There was only one hut at Tarso, and that was the Japanese officer's hut. And outside was a tree, and then a lovely little lake. Now the three of us were taken and given us salt, <coughs> and said, he told us to cut the tree down, and the tree must go that away. <coughs> because the officer's hook was that away, and his pond was that away. We worked nearly all day, and then the tree started to fall. Now, he wanted to go that away. <laughs> well, after it went that away, we made a getaway. <laughs> That night, we had nowhere to lay our heads. We just lay on the on the on the, on the grass. That wasn't any grass really. But before we did, I sang them a song. For dinner, there's rice, tea, and jibbo. For supper, rice, jibbo, and tea. And unless a miracle happens, I know what my...